Chapter 8. Bob. I learned a lot of things today on my adventure with Livy, but here's what I learned after she left. If you put a wet chicken suit in the clothes dryer, all the feathers will come off and the whole thing will shrink into a little ball. The car pulls up outside just as I've rescued the last feather from the lint trap. The tutu scratches at my legs as I climb the stairs with the whole mess in my arms. If I were Superman, I could have just used my heat lasers to dry it off, and it would be good as new. I wait in the closet. Waiting in a closet is not so bad when you know someone will soon be opening in it. Plus, being in there is kind of relaxing, like I don't have to worry about anything other than what's inside my head. I like filling my head. I flip the dictionary open to you. Now that I know where the light cord is, there'll be no stopping me. I get up to Unicorn before Libby swings open the door so wide that the doorknob bangs into the opposite wall. That's going to leave a mark, I say, shutting the book. We can cross Unicorn off the list of things I might be. I could have told you that, she says. I hurry over to the bed to open the bag of clothes that is no doubt waiting for me there. There's no bag. I purse my lips at her and wait for an explanation. So you'll never guess what happened to me in town, Libby says. This better be good. I forgot about you. Only, she sort of looks kind of excited about that, which is more than a little annoying. I forgot, she repeats again. I start to gnash my teeth, but my teeth are already small and kind of stubby. I put my hands on my hips instead. Why are you happy about forgetting again? She shakes her head. I'm not happy about the forgetting part, but now I think I understand why I forgot you the first time. I mean, I know I was really young, but let's face it, you're pretty memorable. I have to agree there. I always thought I was pretty remarkable as far as mysterious creatures go. She begins to pace the room. When we left for dinner, I was thinking about you and the chicken house and the clothes you wanted. But by the time we got into town, I forgot all of it. My eyes widened. I'm less annoyed now and more curious. All of it? She nods. I reach up and lay the back of my hand on Libby's forehead. Maybe you have a fever. She shakes her head. Now listen, it's not me. I think it's coming from you. You have a gift. I think you're magic. I stare at her. Oh, great. So my magic is about people not being able to remember me. What kind of stinky magical gift is that? It's not so bad, she insists. It protects you from strangers, right? I guess, but it makes you forget me too. It would, yes, but I have something that reminds me. She dives into her pocket and pulls her hand out triumphantly to, to reveal the chess piece. I'm trying to keep up. The chip black palm from the H7 square makes you remember me? Yep, I must have figured this out when I was little. Gran said I tried to take it home last time. When I hold it, I remember you. She lowers the palm back onto the board so it can continue its job of protecting the king. It wobbles as she sets it down. We both reach out to steady it and our hands close on it at the same time. Our eyes meet in surprise. We've clutched this same palm between us before. Back then, we'd laughed and rolled around the floor pretending to fight over it. But now we just stare at each other. This action, this coming together, it linked us somehow. Livy is right about the magic. For some reason, people forget about me when they get a certain distance away. But this palm resists it. This means Livy didn't really forget about me when she left five years ago. Well, she did, but not on purpose, because she didn't have the pawn. Knowing this makes a huge difference. We finally let go. See, I tell her, I was right about pawns being powerful. Don't go getting a big head about it. She reaches into her pocket and pulls out a wrapped up caramel and a piece of black licorice. I grab for the licorice. My favorite candy. The lady at the store said I used to get it all the time. I nod, chewing happily. You did. You'd bring it back every time you went to town. You tried it once and said it tasted like dirt. That sounds like me, Libby says, popping the caramel into her mouth. Where did you find the black chess pieces anyway, I ask as I savor my delicious treat. They were downstairs with a bunch of other stuff Graham put out to show me. Her voice is a bit slurpy because of the caramel. There was a green elephant too and a... Ruffus? I jump up. Graham found Ruffus? Huh? I'm not sure. I didn't ask his name. Green and soft, about the size of my head, long trunk. I start at my nose and swing my arm out like a trunk. Sounds like the one, she says. I'm halfway out the door before she yanks me back. Hold on there, mister, she says. Oops, sorry. Will you go and get him for me? Now? Yes, please. I wait by the door, hopping up and down. Ruffus. Ruffus is back. I should probably act my age and not get excited about a stuffed animal. Then she walks in with him. Ruffus! I snatch him from her arms and hug him tight and sniff his head. He smells just the same, like cake in the outdoors. Libby half smiles and half rolls her eyes. I'm glad you have your stuffed animal back. I hold him out to her. Oh, no, he's not mine. Ruffus is yours. Mine? I don't think so. I've never been an elephant person. What a hurtful thing to say. I hug him again. But when, are, but when you were soaking wet in the chicken house, you had him in your arms. 
She takes a step backward in surprise. I did, and he was wet too. Ruffus was wet. Livy steps over to the window that looks out into the yard. Her back is to me for a long time. When she turns around again, her eyes are wide. There's only one place in Grand Yard Ruffus could have gotten wet. I think he fell in the well.